All right. So coincidental but very pleasing, there's some really cool work happening at New York Public Library. So uh, I'm fortunate to be able to have now a couple of my colleagues come here and make some presentation about that. So please welcome first James English. Thanks. Hi, uh, thank you. And uh, just want to do a quick poll. Uh, how many people out there have gotten an ebook from the library or get ebooks from the library? And I assume that means you were successful at downloading the ebook, <laughs> or did you try just try and uh, go to Amazon? <laughs> I assume that was it. So um, what I'm going to talk about is a IMLS funded grant project that we're doing, and you can say it's part just doing our job at the library, and the other part doing a, a kind of an experiment. Uh, to see if we can simplify the process of getting ebooks from the library. Um, so what am I going to talk about? Well, what is Library Simplified? What are, why are we doing this? And what can we actually do to address some of the things that we, we, we're going to struggle with, uh, our current approach and our progress to date? So what is Library Simplified? Uh, basically, it's to provide libraries an ebook solution to find, borrow, and download an ebook in three clicks or less. So for those of you that raised your hand, how many of you did it in three clicks or less? <laughs> All right. Um, so the ideal process really is that you would sign in, search the, uh, our catalog for a title, and then you download it to your device. And it would look something like uh, what you see up there on the right. So why are we doing it? Well, the experience of downloading an ebook doesn't look like that in the library. In fact, it, seriously, it really does suck. It's uh, about 19 steps at worst case at uh, New York Public Library. Uh, generally, uh, that 19 steps uh, is pretty consistent. We took the labs team at NYPL and our web development team, and then we tried to eat our own dog food with our own apps and download it. After two hours, we finally figured out how to do it in 19 steps. Um, that probably explains uh, why libraries are a fail at ebooks uh, by many metrics. Uh, if you look at uh, library or uh, ebook adoption for our user base versus uh, ebook adoption in the commercial market space, we're way, way, way behind. Uh, not only in the rate of adoption, but in just the number of people who get ebooks from library uh, compared to the regular marketplace. And some people try to say it's because libraries have limited collection. Um, I don't think that's true. We spend about $2 million a year on ebooks at New York Public Library. It's a, actually a pretty big budget, I think, for our public library. Uh, and people generally rate library uh, collections as pretty good. So it's not necessarily that we just buy a bunch of bad stuff. I think librarians are good at doing collection development. It's kind of in our, our DNA. Um, what is it costing us to do that? Well, we, we do believe user experience is the biggest problem with that adoption. Um, it's a large portion of our calls. Now, these are the calls that we take. Uh, our, our platform providers uh, take a lot of calls for us as part of their support agreements. And we actually take a lot of calls about how to work Kindle. Uh, unfortunately, Amazon doesn't pro provide library support for its reading device, which we do. <laughs> and then 93% uh, of those calls we just can't satisfy. They, we, we just cannot solve their problem. It's out of our control. And what are the big things that they're, they're doing? Well, it's kind of the main things you come to a library for, to find a book, <laughs> find it, see if it's available, check it out, or place a hold on it. Um, it's kind of sad. Those are the core three clicks that we want them to do, um, and they can't get that done. So what's happening with this? Well, if you look at the value chain, there's really a different value chain um, with print books versus ebooks, and the library's role in the print uh, book industry is pretty well established, and we take, a, I think, a, a larger part in that because we actually do the distribution of that content. Uh, we do reader's advisory. We actually guide people to the books they want to read in our collection. Um, it's pretty natural to us. But in ebooks, we basically are down at the consumption end, and we subsidize uh, those that are very technically savvy and, and wealthy to find ebooks in our collection. They can't find it on Amazon or they just want to do it for free. So that's really not the, the role we want to uh, be in at the library. And I think with ebooks, there's a larger opportunity that libraries could uh, take advantage of as this industry is changing. So what can we do? 
Well, typically a good strategy uh, to address a problem is really to take it, <laughs> one is to solve those problems and then uh, take advantages of changes in the environment and utilize your core strengths to do so. It's a simple strategy. It tends to work in very successful companies. We can probably do that at the library. So some of the technology issues out there that uh, we see with ebooks are the lack of interoperability, DRM, platforms, formats, tools, uh, standards and specifications not adopted by those, uh, all those different uh, portions of the ecosystem, and these really siloed channels to content. Uh, market issues, there are monopolies, monopsonies, if you want to call them. And I'm not just talking about Amazon in the library space. We have one, it's called Overdrive. They own 90% market share for ebooks in libraries. Um, you know, what is it? We, we tend to focus on Amazon, but let's, let's really look in the library space and we have our own monopolies to deal with. Um, what, is, what do those lead to? High cost, bad licensing deals for libraries, limited choice of content. Uh, and bad user experiences, as I, I showed in some of the other uh, metrics. Um, we also are forced into these multiple content channels and different platforms, so our uh, users actually have to know where the book is to go find it. So what platform does it, uh, does it exist on in our, in our library? They really can't go to our library and just go to the content. They have to actually have some prior knowledge of where it may reside, which I think is kind of a silly proposition. Um, Libraries' failure to access the broader market. Uh, there's a self-publishing market that is uh, really changing the industry. Independent publishers we don't really work with uh, that much. And then the public domain, we tend to just boot people over to Gutenberg and let them fend for themselves, um, when I think there's probably a, a more active role with libraries in some of these public domain uh, projects and their preservation and their distribution and promotion. Um, and then we, on the legal side, have a, a there's no uh, digital right of first sale. On the physical side, we had 1908, I think it was 1908 uh, court, Supreme Court precedence that allows us to buy a book and then do what we want to do with that and lend it. We don't really have that right with digital content. And then we actually shoot ourselves in the foot sometimes with lend policies because we really want, we think that an e-book should look just, it'd be less confusing if we just treat it like a physical book for our patrons. Well, the reality is people don't need to come to a library to return the ebook. It will disappear on its own, thanks to DRM. Um, and they don't really need to go to the library to check out the ebook. Um, we have some key strengths, though, so I'm hopeful. We librarians have a great knowledge of books. Uh, we have a, a strong trust and tradition in readers' advisory. Uh, again, we have, for at least our, our our library, we have some scale and we have some money that we can uh, address this problem with as opposed to just throwing money at it, uh, maybe invest it wisely. Um, and people trust the library to pr protect their interest and to advise on what to read. And we actually, in our, our present location, we have a access to a really great developer community. Um, some other opportunities, there's a lot of change in the industry going on. Standards and specification bodies are evolving and the open source community is strong in this area. Uh, this, this conference itself is an example of that. Uh, there are, are actually DRM alternatives out there, uh, so we're not necessarily locked into any one platform and there's some potential to access those. And then, frankly, there's some opportunities to remove intermediation. So. One of those opportunities, changes in the industry. If you look at the industry, a lot of it's collapsing down for, from technology, and we should really look to see how the market is actually addressing some of this, this uh, application of technology in the, in the landscape. You probably see some uh, one player in there in particular that's doing a very good job of doing these different uh, roll-up strategies on the ebook value chain, from whether it's doing content aggregation to doing channel aggregation into the markets. Uh, Amazon's uh, not pulling any punches. They're taking an all, 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 uh, every strategy uh, possible to do this and own that value chain. Something to learn from there. All right, so the platform game. Well, uh, stop throwing money after, you know, after bad. So why do we you know, throw money after these uh, siloed uh, uh, platforms out there? There's, they are doing everything that's causing some of these problems, and so there's probably a way to 
avoid some of these things such as high switching costs, network effects for content as well as applications and access to content, and barriers to entry for new and innovative content, books, publishers, and business models. Open standards and interoperable standards will, of course, lower these barriers, lower some of the switching costs uh, for the providers, open up new tools and skills uh, uh, applicable across all of this, and promote competition uh, where it's needed, and uh, remove some of the network effects that accrue on these platforms. So maybe this is where a library should start to focus some of its uh, collection dollars or its platform fees towards is actually investing in these type of open source platforms and uh, interoperability standards. All right, one of those is, again, goes back into it, get behind the standards. I mean, what would really help us is a unified distribution standard for text-centric context, uh, book serials, learning, and content to reduce uh, cost and service and content innovation. Some of what uh, uh, he was talking about and uh, create an interoperable and open ecosystem for reading. And there's a lot of great work being done out there. Maybe these are the folks that we need to be working with as libraries. Um, I think we also need to not only work with the, the open source community and the standards bodies, but let's work better with industry. We understand authors got to eat, and the publishers have to be able to pay the people that do this great work to put content together and out there. But we kind of hit a, a cost penalty by having to deal with the publishing industry through middlemen. Uh, those middlemen are doing nothing more than just connecting us with digital content. So what, how much value can they actually add in distributing an ebook to us? Um, I don't know if it's really that much. <laughs> it's a pretty high uh, price that they charge in between. And what it effectively does is lower our ability to buy more content from publishers. So, you know, there's, there's something to be said there for maybe uh, working more direct with the publishing industry itself as libraries. And again, we know that most of the content is uh, that people in our, our uh, library users demand is the popular content, but we tend to only focus on about a third of the industry as libraries for where we get that content. And there's a much larger publishing ind industry out there, mainly indie, indie publishers and the self-publishing industry. And these are basic, these graphs here uh, derived from an author's earning report, and these are unit sales. So it was pretty surprising to me to see that, wow, we're missing a lot of good content that our readers may want to access as libraries. And then DRM. <laughs> it's kind of the big gray elephant in the room, and uh, it is what it is. And uh, quite frankly, we'll have to try to somehow invest in a more interoperable DRM between these platforms or just use multiple, uh, multi-DRM technology or have that capability in our, in our, in our systems. Um, we know that DRM makes it difficult to get an e-book on the devices and traps our users into single retail channels. Um, it's unfortunately uh, applied to 100% of the content on the big five. Only 50% of indie publishers. And an interesting uh, stat I found online was that for indie publishers, again, they only do about 50% of their content of that content that is not DRM, it, sales at, it sells at twice the rate. So I think there's actually a lot more money to be made in publishing without DRM. Um, we'll see. Uh, with regard to libraries, again, we can do some stuff a little bit smarter. Right now, uh, we're completely intermediated between our users. This would be akin to opening up library branches but not have librarians staff it actually have some contract third party to manage the circulation desk, stock the shelves with books, do our collection development. That's what we do with ebooks today. Um, maybe we should do something different. Uh, so what we're looking at with regard to Library Simplified is kind of intermediating the intermediators uh, to create a more direct relationship with our users so we can better understand not only uh, our service, uh, but deliver better service and maybe the content that they want to read. Our current approach in the short term is to improve user satisfaction, uh, acquire more content, uh, more titles, more copies, more vendors, more sources of content, improve our user experience and ebook discovery and access uh, that make us a, a viable one-stop shop. There's a Pew finding out there that uh, only about 12% of people start at the library to find an ebook. The rest of them go online to online retail. And that's a sad thing, because I remember the days when I got on my little bicycle when I wanted to read something and trucked across town to the public library to find something to read. Uh, 
today. Kids just log on to Amazon. Um, and then I think there's this, again, this opportunity, and Leonard's really going to talk more about this. Uh, he's done some great work, and this is turning high uh, quality public domain and mid-list titles into best library bestsellers through uh, new models of recommendation and discovery of that content. Uh, long term, we want to promote open source technologies and interoperable ebook technology. We want to improve collection and acquisition costs, of course, so we can buy more content. Uh, we want to maybe approach authors directly uh, to publish and acquire licenses from them and become a book market maker through a system-wide effort to promote books online and through live, our live programs where we have authors come and talk about their books. And then another thing is we just got to keep at it. I mean, we're, we'll probably get told no a lot of times as we approach the industry because it's kind of a new concept working direct with uh, libraries and, and publishers. Uh, there's 9, 000, over 9,000 libraries. That's a, that's a lot of different libraries for publishers to have to deal with, and we understand that. It's probably not practical. Maybe there's some things in that area that uh, libraries could do to make that process easier. Um, and then explore lobbying legal positions vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, e -books. So we are building basically what I'll call a, a, a multi, what is that? You talked about earlier in the, the title of your presentation that you got the, the multivalent system. It's a plug-in architecture, basically. So we're, we're basically going to put something in front that will uh, try to intermediate all these uh, different content repositories, the metadata repositories about this content, our own library systems out there that can be problematic for getting stuff, uh, and then work with DRM to you know, make it not as uh, a big of a burden on our users in terms of understanding which DRM is protecting which piece of content on which platform that they had. Um, and then try to fall in on all of that with use, utilizing some uh, new and evolving standards such as OPDS and uh, the Redium uh, body of technologies. Um, this is what the server environment looks like. Uh, we think it's not too onerous of something to put in place for our libraries, especially with cloud hosting and, the, and the, what you can do there. Our progress to date, well, we got a lot of good funding. Uh, one of the largest grants from the IMLS uh, to date. Uh, we have re actually received commercial uh, gifts in, in terms of giving access to free software out there to, to explore and u utilize in this project. Uh, we actually have a beta application, uh, which is interesting because it actually holds more content than any of our paid applications. Uh, we have 80 to 100,000 titles that we can provide, and uh, we can distribute about 40,000 uh, pieces of public domain. And we've just done that in over four months, uh, and we've done it for 100, 150K. So that's pretty good. We've got a lot more money left in the, in the, the pot to go with. Um, so uh, I, I do want to put a, a moment out. I can talk about this, what we've got today. I think it's actually a pretty nice app. It's uh, clean. It works. Uh, not too fancy and trying to go, go with uh, this really rich animations on it, but I, I really like its sparse and simple simplicity in the user interaction. Um, from book discovery to actually borrowing, so not making the user have to define what type of borrowing transaction, the machine actually does it for them and presents those options. Uh, and it's not necessarily the buy button first and then, oh yeah, you can click down this menu over here and figure out how to borrow from the library. It's going to be a borrow and read transaction up front. And then we, you just need to use your library card and that's it. Um, and then thanks to Redium, and I, I cannot speak enough about the work that Micah Bowers and all the people that are, are, are putting towards the Redium Foundation. They're really what's making this possible for us. Uh, right now, we're kind of limited to the type of content we can actually display to our readers because it's locked in these proprietary formats. Uh, that's locking off a lot of rich content that the publishers are investing in, in building. Uh, and the Redium Foundation and that technology that we're building this off of is really allowing us to open that up. And that will uh, allow us to do a lot more things when it comes to accessibility and reaching those less fortunate in our, our service population. Um, if you want to learn more or get involved, hopefully with Redium, I would say get involved or get involved with us on librarysimplified.org. We have a website. Uh, there's redium.org and find out all the wonderful work they're doing. Uh, and then OPDS spec is something that's making it very, uh, uh, that we're getting involved in and actually helping to drive some extensions to that spec to make it easier to even other third-party platforms to get ebooks from the library. Uh, it's not just our reader, it could be your reader. 
uh, as well. So I'm going to turn it over to, to Leonard Richardson, and he's going to talk about some of the work he's done with Gutenberg. through this. Uh, my name is Leonard Richardson. I am the uh, application architect for Library Simplified and as part of that work it has been my privilege to integrate uh, the Project Gutenberg library into our collection. Uh, we all know Project Gutenberg. We all use it in our demo applications that we present here. Um, we read the books. Um, these books are free. This is very important for a public library. Um, but important, especially for the Library Simplified project, is the fact that Project Gutenberg gives us the text we need to ask the question, what kind of reading environment would we build if the only consideration was reader experience? What could we come up with? Um, while I was working on this, I learned a lot about uh, how Project Gutenberg works. Um, I originally thought it worked something like this. This is uh, how something like Internet Archive will digitize uh, 10 to 15,000 books a day. Uh, you scan it, you run some OCR, you stick it up on a website. Uh, this is the actual project progress for Project Gutenberg. Uh, most of the uh, books come in through a separate project called Distributed Proofreaders, and uh, they will take a book that uh, was, um, here's a simplified version to spare your eyes. Uh, they'll take a book that was put up on Internet Archive and they'll go through a multi-step proofreading process to get a good version of the text. Uh, so instead of 10,000 books a day, they release 3 to 15 books per day, which is still very impressive. Um, and I'm sure you know that uh, the text of a Project Gutenberg book, although a sort of no frills, is a generally a very high quality text, um, which makes integrating Project Gutenberg into our library system my favorite kind of problem, because it's a problem that looks like it's been solved until you actually try to put it into practice. When you discover that Project Gutenberg does not play by the rules of the publishing industry, it plays by the rules of the internet. So you download a Project Gutenberg e-text, you load it up in your ebook browser, and the first thing you're likely to see is five or six pages of uh, the legalese that explains what Project Gutenberg is, explains that uh, you are within your rights to do absolutely anything with your text, and on and on and on, and eventually it gets to the book you wanted to read. Um, this is Project Gutenberg's description of Moby Dick. This is not a description I would show to a patron. Um, this is the book Project Gutenberg put out recently called The Horse's Mouth, uh, de determining the age of a horse by looking at its teeth. Um, the closest uh, in-print book I could find was this book by UC Davis on, on uh, a, a sort of horse medical reference. Um, Project Gutenberg puts out books with no regard to whether there's a market for the book, whether uh, there's an audience of people who will read it. Um, I think this is great, but it does complicate the situation for a library. Um, the, re the reason Project Gutenberg can get away with this is, well, what's a volunteer project? They can do what they want, but uh, the, reason it, the reason it works is because the Project Gutenberg search experience is great because there's all these books you've heard about. You know their titles. And if you put the title into a search engine, you will see the Project Gutenberg uh, version of that book. You go in there, you click, you read the book, you can download it, put it on any device. It's a great experience. If you don't know the exact book you are looking for, the experience is really lousy. Um, the best way to do it is to look through these bookshelves, which are wiki pages on Project Gutenberg that uh, people try to keep up to date. The uh, main challenge for uh, me at the library is that uh, if you want to get more than, say, 100 books off of Project Gutenberg, they will ban your IP. So you need to set up a mirror. You need to get every single Project Gutenberg book uh, via rsync, set up your own mirror, then you can do whatever you want with the mirror. Um, that's a really huge hurdle. And 
uh, for lack of being able to surmount that hurdle, what we do right now is we pay money to people who have taken Project Gutenberg books, repackaged them, and uh, published them on OverDrive. So we pay to license DRM encumbered editions of public domain materials, most of which were originally sourced from Project Gutenberg. Um, wait, wait. Guess what? You can get Project Gutenberg books from OverDrive, but they sit in this sad little area that's a, a dump of the 2010 Project Gutenberg DVD, and its browse interface is even worse than the browse interface on Project Gutenberg. You can see nine books at a time. So this was the challenge I took on. What would it take to treat Project Gutenberg books like real books? What would it take to actually have them in our collection as first class citizens instead of having to sit at the proverbial kids table. And once I got into this, it turns out there were a ton of problems. Um, Project Gutenberg, uh, when they put out a new edition of the book, they keep the old edition in place. Um, so you might have, uh, in some cases, five to six different editions of the same book. Um, they don't have, they have their own standard for uh, referring to books. They refer to them by Project Gutenberg number. There's no relationship between this number and ISBN or OCLC number. Uh, like I showed you, they don't have descriptions. Um, e they either don't have covers. Uh, the cover is a uh, sort of green piece of cardboard with the book title written on it in, in gold leaf, um, or the cover just doesn't really appeal to modern sensibilities. Um, and of course, there's a lot of stuff in Project Gutenberg that very few people want to read. But it's not really clear from first principles which of those books are the ones people don't want to read. Uh, so I sort of took uh, some tools for reading the entire corpus of Project Gutenberg at once, um, mostly without actually looking at the text, and uh, try to figure out what, is, what would it look like to present these books to a 21st century circulating library audience in a way that would um, not, at least not drive them away. Um, so I started with the RDF metadata, which Gutenberg publishes, and I cross-referenced that against um, some, uh, a lot of data provided by OCLC, which is sort of the collective intelligence of uh, the American librarians. Um, uh, I was able to get this, uh, of course, because I work for a library. Um, and uh, what I got, I got it down a little bit. Um, the uh, sort of maroon color is the ones that I'm focusing on. This is uh, 21,000 of the 47,000 books. Uh, there were a, f a lot of duplicate editions, which I had to detect. Uh, there were some, a lot of books that aren't in English, which I will be dealing with, but I need different tools to deal with them. Um, there were a number of periodicals, which except for certain science fiction periodicals are of limited interest to patrons. Um, the green is stuff that was not an OCLC, and I put an asterisk after that because some of it is an OCLC, it's just that the data wasn't good enough to meet my standards, so I'm sort of saving that for a second pass. But 21,000 is plenty. Um, the uh, local bookstore in my neighborhood has uh, about 11,000 titles, so this is a very, a pretty large bookstore worth of titles that are potentially of interest to patrons. Um, uh, ignore the arrows here, they don't line up properly, but uh, I used OCLC data plus the Gutenberg data to figure out um, how these books would be classified in uh, a branch library or a small bookstore. Um, and there's actually a lot of overlap with uh, the stuff that um, patrons like to read in ebook formats. Uh, the, most, the most transferable one is mystery. Um, a mystery fan um, will like a lot of 19th century mystery books. Um, romance, a little bit less. Um, science fiction, it's okay. Uh, anything with a strong historical component uh, travels pretty well. Uh, the one that is very popular um, in, for, for modern readers uh, is it, one that's very popular for modern readers is science. Unfortunately, although there's a ton of uh, science books in Project Gutenberg, um, only one of them is uh, of interest to a modern reader, even though in many cases the science is still accurate. So I'm mostly focusing um, on history 
uh, works of history and works of fiction. Um, but I can't just pres I can't just you know throw you a thousand science fiction books or three thousand mystery books. I got to figure out uh, which are the books you are most likely to want to read. And I uh, basically OCLC gave me information about how many editions of a book have been published. Um, and how many library holdings it has. And when we think about classic books, um, we think of a book whose enduring popularity uh, allows us to sort of think of the popularity as a synonym for quality. Um, so I basically came up with an algorithm. I will spare you the details. Uh, but this is the top result of the algorithm. These are, according to uh, my algorithm in the OCLC data, the most classic books in Project Gutenberg, and I wouldn't call this my top 10, but it's pretty good. Um, and all the ones you're thinking of are a little bit lower down. Um, so just to sort of show you that this works, I'm going to hand sell you on uh, three books you may not have heard of that I really love um, and that I'm happy uh, sort of showed up pretty high in the classicness ranking. Um, this one is uh, number 297. It's called Roast Beef Medium. And this is uh, a book of the genre I like to call post-electricity American fiction. Uh, this came out in 1913, and it's, it's very old-fashioned. The main character is a woman who is a traveling corset saleswoman, um, clearly not a profession that exists anymore. But her attitudes um, are recognizably modern, and it is a fun read um, for a 20th, 21st century reader. Um, this is a, a maybe a comedy of manners uh, from the 19th century called Cranford. Uh, very funny. Uh, this one's a little more popular. Um, it was made into a, a BBC series. Um, highly recommended. Uh, this one's a little interesting. Um, this is a, a mystery book, and it's sort of like if Bertie Wooster was a jewel thief. Uh, um, it's, a, it's a great read. And, but it only it ranked actually pretty low in the classicness ranking, and uh, this is a shortcoming of my algorithm. Uh, Project Gutenberg calls this the amateur cracksman. Uh, most of the published editions call it Raffles, the amateur cracksman. So there wasn't an exact title match, um, and that hurt it in the rankings. Um, so now I've sort of got a picture of which of the Project Gutenberg books of the 47,000, which are the five or six or 7,000 that we should uh, try to try to push to people, books they may not have heard of, but that they will like looking at. Um, next is taking care of the description problem. OCLC um, actually has a ton of descriptions for these books. The problem is they have a ton of descriptions for these books. So uh, a book like um, Alice in Wonderland will have 700, 800 descriptions, and I got to pick one. Uh, this is the output of the algorithm I came up with to pick one description. It's pretty good. That was my goal, find a description, that's pretty good. Um, and uh, basically the way it works is what do you want out of a decent description? You want it to sort of hit the high points of the book um, but not be too long. So I basically uh, did a, a process very similar to the, uh, forgot the name, but the tagging that was mentioned earlier to find the uh, the, you know, the, the main characters and, and such in the book, find a description that has a good ratio of mentioning those things to uh, mentioning other stuff. Um, so we got good enough descriptions for most of these books without doing a lot of work. Um, second is the covers. Um, uh, my colleague, Mauricio Giraldo, came up with uh, two algorithms for generating covers from Project Gutenberg books. Um, the one on the upper left, which is purely geometric, is um, if we know absolutely nothing about the book except for the title, uh, we just sort of have this, you know, abstract art, um, just something that makes the book distinct from other uh, books on the same page. Um, if we happen to have illustrations in the book, a lot of uh, the Project Gutenberg books have scanned illustrations, we can pick one of those illustrations, we can turn it into a little book cover. Um, these covers are certainly uh, open to criticism. They're not the best book covers in the world, but here is our competition. <laughs> so I definitely think uh, Mauricio did a pretty good job um, given the, the limited time we had to spend on the, pro the uh, 
the project of making book covers for books that didn't have them. Um, there's a ton of problems I haven't solved. Um, I'm just going to mention the two most um, pressing ones. One of them is that a lot of children's books are not suitable for 21st century children. They should, in fact, be kept far away from 21st century children. Um, we're going to have to uh, either get some librarian expertise um, or do some textual analysis to uh, sort of find the books that, that contain hazardous materials. Um, the other problem is more of an opportunity. Um, well, I was uh, while I'm working on this, uh, I discovered that during the course of digitizing these books, the Project Gutenberg Distributed Proofreader uh, Project Manager for a book will often write a very good description for the book. Um, this is a, a, a book that's basically a unit history of a, a unit in the American Civil War. Um, this may be the first description of this book ever written. Um, it was written to get people interested in the distributed proofreading project. Once this book goes on to Project Gutenberg, as far as I know, uh, this information is, is just going to be lost. Um, I could not find this information for books that were actually on Project Gutenberg. So uh, one of the things I'm going to be working on in the future is um, sort of engage, uh, trying to engage more with uh, the books before they get into Project Gutenberg. Um, because I think that's a, a place where the library can make a big difference without disrupting the uh, process that works really well. Um, so Project Gutenberg, it's, it's a fire hose. There's a ton of books in here. Most of these books are bad, but guess what? The same thing is true of commercial publishing. <laughs> and this is the job of the library. It is to get control of the output of publishing and figure out which book is the right book for this patron. Um, so I think that this is, uh, this is a job I am uh, happy doing and um, it's true that uh, because of the idiosyncrasy, the idiosyncrasies of the Gutenberg project, um, it is more difficult to integrate the, the, the books, but I do think that there are readers for these books and uh, the price is definitely right and uh, we also get uh, platform benefits. Thank you. All right, questions for these guys? Sure. Um, let, let me handle the comment and then and then do the question. So the comment was uh, to to bring to our collective attention Project Gutenberg, which um, basically takes Gutenberg text, puts them in GitHub so that they can be um, processed for better presentation. And uh, processing these texts for better presentation is definitely something that's on my to do list. And I think uh, Project Gutenberg is a great idea. Um, I have the same. Uh, misgivings about it as I do looking at that uh, distributed proofreader's description that's going to get erased. Um, I would like the process to happen before the book actually gets into Project Gutenberg because there's an enormous amount of work, um, version controllable work, that goes on during the proofreading process and um, from my perspective it's very important to capture that um, and uh, have uh, Project, instead of having Project Gutenberg um, sort of come in afterwards, pick up the clean product from Gutenberg. Um, so yeah, it's definitely, um, it's definitely a great project, um, but now that I've sort of seen the inner workings of distributed proofreaders, I'd like to encourage that to, to move back in the process a little bit before uh, the history gets wiped, as it were. Um, so you also had a question.
Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, the question had to do with uh, open access works that are not in Project Gutenberg and um, keeping a repository of basically verifiable assertions that these works were in fact open. Um, I, would, uh, I would love to be doing that. Um, more than doing that, I would love to be have, just having those books in our catalog in the first place. And I think once I, once I move that in, um, our legal department will sort of force me to develop the other part of it. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I'm not promising anything, but that's that's definitely something that's within the scope of things we could do. Sure. Uh, so the question was, um, the, are we applying anything like the classic NIC algorithm we apply to, to Gutenberg works to the books that we license through OverDrive? Uh, the answer is, right now, those are uh, completely separate processes. Um, we do have a project in the planning stages to uh, revamp our purchasing process. Um, and once we do that, uh, we will definitely be doing, uh, although the, the final since there's money involved, the final buy decision will always be made by a, a, a human expert. Um, we will be uh, applying the, the tools we've developed for getting a handle on Gutenberg to uh, sort of guide uh, the experts into um, stuff that they may not have noticed that we think they might want to look at. Um, so it's definitely uh, something we'd like to do, but it's not going to be, the, it's, uh, it's not, uh, something that's part of this project, and it's probably not going to be the same algorithm because uh, the classic Nix algorithm is uh, basically only works for books that have had a long time to have a lot of printings and be in a lot of libraries. And what we the when you get away from classics, uh, the notions of popularity and quality become disconnected, um, which is not to say that we uh, that we're snobs and we won't. Um, uh, lend out books that are popular but we don't think are very good. We'll certainly do that because uh, that's what people want. But they need to be measured separately. We need to, um, if, if a book is like that, we need to know why we're lending it out. Are we doing it because it's uh, super popular but mediocre or because it's popular and good? There is, oh, go ahead. There is one thing that we did learn in his uh, Part of the process by which he, he normalizes a lot of the Gutenberg corpus, we actually found that we needed to apply to uh, our trade pubs that we, we license. And those go through a similar workflow to normalize the descriptive data, their classification, so that we can you know, present them alongside of the, those Project Gutenberg works. So there is a portion of that. Right, yeah, that's a good point. Um, the, the new books that are published, they are in OCLC, and we do get the OCLC data for them. Uh, but that's mainly so that we can understand uh, where they should be filed in the uh, library, as it were. Uh, the question was, is there an alternative to DRM that we're thinking about? And um, right now, we, we understand as libraries that we, we need to protect the rights of content. So we know we are actually entrusted with a lot of special collections where the rights holders still maintain that. And DRM actually does provide an opportunity for us to protect that, the, that entrusted right to, to house and store and lend this content. Uh, but the problem that we see is that DRM is primarily used just to do vendor lock-in to uh, channels of distribution. 
And the alternative that I could think about beyond just merely some permeable watermark for that content that says it, you know, this is duly licensed by NYPL or a public library uh, name uh, would be something like LCP, which is a, a what they call light uh, content protection out of the Redium Foundation, but it's really, I think they're going to rename it to interoperable uh, content protection, and it's based on the public key infrastructure that we all take for granted on the internet that allows us to log into our banks and do that type of transaction. Uh, there's an established infrastructure out on the web for uh, securing uh, content and uh, inter uh, interfaces that we work with. And if there is a way to bring that into this space of ebooks, so it doesn't matter, uh, really, the DRM doesn't matter uh, where that it is stored or hosted f uh, at with regard to a, uh, a particular platform. Right. Uh, the question is, once the uh, Gutenberg texts have completed their processing, where is it going to live? Um, we are going to host it. Um, at the very least, we're going to be making it available to the partner libraries in the Simplified Project. Um, I would also like to make it publicly available. I don't want to step on anyone's toes. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I do want to make it publicly available. The only caveat is um, some of the data that we get from OCLC, like the descriptions, um, that is uh, licensed for non-commercial use. Um, anything that, uh, it, pretty much any work we put into it, like the generated covers, uh, we will be donating that back to the public domain. Uh, but we need to be careful to uh, sort of keep the public domain stuff separated from the non-commercial use only stuff when we're uh, sort of giving it to all and sundry. Um, the question was, uh, why are we putting a lot of effort into the, the, this, this necessity to deal with the transaction, the categorization, and uh, distribution of the books instead of just using the web? Well, I, a large part of that is at New York City, a lot of people, if you ride the subway, uh, read books on a disconnected uh, format. And uh, EPUB is a great uh, packaged uh, website, if you will, is basically what an ebook is um, for that platform. The other thing is we buy our content and it's pretty much 100% DRM protected. So we, it's just the nature of what we got to do in order to get the books to our, to our patrons. So typically, the, I think Leonard says it best, our job as librarians is to connect uh, readers to books and it can be tedious, uh, unappreciated work and we do it for free. Uh, for the patron, and that's just our job. So we're going to do a lot of work trying to connect readers to books. Okay. Call for a pay-a-pass question. Great. I'm just curious, but he has it in his children's books. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's, there's super racist stuff. You, you don't even want to know. Um, and uh, the question I was hoping someone would ask is, yeah, uh, it's Origin of Species. Um, there's, there's a lot of other science books. It's still very accurate, but it's, you know, it's the, the book on you know, telling the horse's age by the teeth. I'm sure that still works, um, but there's not a lot of demand for it anymore. <laughs> All right. So thank you, guys. Um, so, thank you everyone.
Um, I want to uh, also just quickly on the heels of this presentation, hat tip to Juliet Sutherland who helped create distributed proofreaders and many of us had a uh, privilege of working with her in that role and uh, she comes from a long line of brilliant people. Uh, her father also significantly contributed to computer science and to uh, the screens that we see every day as well as to visions of the future that we are still working on. So both of them have contributed in amazing ways. So uh, just a random round of applause for the Sutherlands. Um, so I, I want to thank you again and I want to call my colleagues up on the stage because this is not my conference, it's all of our conference and I uh, want to have Thomas, Hannah and Grace join me up here right at the end, please. And um, <laughs> Johannes, if you can. So thank you guys. Uh, this is really so much a joint project of all of us and also of you. And we really appreciate you uh, participating through five books and browsers. Uh, you know, certainly we had some question about whether or not we should do this year, but it was very ratifying to have everybody here and uh, to start thinking already about what BIB 6 should be um, and how we shape BIB into the future to try to get to BIB 10 so that Hugh will continue to show up here and <laughs> <coughs> perhaps lament still um, at BIB, BIB 10 that we are not quite yet where we need to be to design the tools that create tools that allow people to work with their creativity and their insight and knowledge um, to build the kind of information and entertainment that we want to see and that we all here, I think, know is possible. So thank you as we close BIV 5, and we'll see you again, and uh, be safe out there. Please clean up. If you could grab stuff that's lying around, dump it into a receptacle, we'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Reicht auf der Mittel auf der Milchstein, Funkelsinn.